Oh, hey, ben, good day, bonjour. Hey, welcome to another gardening episode. So today we're going to talk about some ways to increase your garden's output without increasing your garden size. And also I'm going to share some of my methods for working and gardening in heavy clay soils. So come on, check this out. I don't want to saw. When I first started gardening, I uh, did a lot of traditional gardening. That's row gardening, in long straight rows with a walking path in between each. And it's very easy to recognize where your plants are supposed to be. There's not supposed to be anything growing around it. So that that's just what gardening is all about, right? You, you you do a lot of watering, a lot of weeding, and and uh, you do everything you can to make it as productive as possible. Mais là, je me suis mis à regarder l'espace que j'utilise puis le travail que je mets dedans. Puis là, j'ai remarqué comment beaucoup d'espace qui est dédié au sentier pour marcher, puis comment peu d'espace qui ont pour le vrai jardinage. Si tu en as ça, on les met côte à côte, c'est quasiment égal. Le montant d'espace pour moi, puis le montant d'espace dédié à mes plantes. Donc, j'ai regardé à d'autres alternatives pour essayer d'augmenter la surface de croissance de dans mon jardin. Regarde ça de plus de près. If instead of row gardens, you widen your rows to make garden beds instead. That way, basically, you have like three or four rows per garden bed. And that way, you're eliminating the walking path in between those garden rows, and yet you increase the surface of growing area in your garden. Just a little simple geometry, and right there, it massively increases your productivity. If you compare the growing spaces side by side, it's almost two to one ratio. Almost a little bit over twice as much growing space per walking path space for the same uh, surface area on your on your property. So the math makes sense. Mais ça, comment c'est que ça marche avec les passages entre les plantes? Dans le jardin traditionnel, on met les plantes en rangée avec un espace recommandé. Mais ça laisse beaucoup d'espace entre les plantes, là, dans les petits coins là, qui restent. Là. Ça, c'est de l'espace vide, parfaite place pour les mauvaises herbes à pousser, ça. Puis là, c'est beaucoup de temps mis à exerber nos jardins. Dans l'exemple ici, on a huit euh, rangées de jardinage de 20 plantes chaque, qui nous donne 160 plantes. Maintenant, si on regarde à faire nos semences sur des, euh, des garden beds à la place, trois rangées à la fois sur un jardin, ça nous donne 240 plantes. Mais là, si on regarde un autre plan pour espacer les plantes, place de en rangée droite, qu'on les espace en triangle. C'est-à-dire, les espaces entre les plantes, il y a une plante de planter de là-dedans. Au lieu de 12 rangées de 20 plantes, on a 20 rangées de 20 plantes, qui nous donnent 400 plantes. Puis là, la manière que ça marche, on fait une rangée avec l'espacage comme recommandé. La rangée suivante est décalée de sorte que les plantes se trouvent entre celles de la première rangée, tout en gardant l'espacage le, recommandé entre chaque plante. Et voici pour démontrer, on commence par euh, planter notre première plante. Et là, ensuite, à 45 degrés, on plante notre deuxième. Et ensuite, de nouveau à 45 degrés, juste à côté de la première plante, on place la troisième plante. Et on continue avec ce, ce pattern-là. C'est 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, toujours en triangle, comme ça. Et ça finit par faire une... Euh, couvrir toute la surface avec en masse d'espace pour chaque plante, mais aussi euh, qu'il n'y ait pas assez d'espace pour laisser le, de lumière pour les mauvaises herbes à pousser. Si on est capable de tout couvrir la terre, exclure la lumière, du, euh, de la surface du jardin, les mauvaises herbes auront de la misère à dépasser puis à déjouer nos plantes agricoles. Le pattern, ça, ça finit par simuler euh, un nid d'abeilles. Le nid d'abeilles, c'est un exemple où la nature a trouvé une solution pour impacter autant de choses rondes aussi proches l'une de l'autre. Euh, des bulles aussi, euh, des bubbles dans, dans l'eau, du savon, ça fait la même chose. Si toutes les bubbles sont la même grandeur, ils vont se mettre dans une trame, dans, une, dans un pattern comme ce site. Euh, ça fait si qu'on utilise les, euh, les solutions que la nature a déjà trouvées, on se sauve beaucoup de trop.
here I got some beans, so poke, poke a hole, it's got a bean in it. Fertilizer that feeds you and your corn. Beans, legumes, lovely addition to your garden. These are called provider beans. I always like to have these in my garden. If there's any plant in this world that I couldn't do without, it's the humble green bean. Planted all over the place. It won't grow that tall. The corn's going to get a lot taller than this. It'll keep it shaded a bit. Might not get quite as much as many beans, but it'll feed my corn. And in the same garden, instead of just corn, I'm getting corn and beans. The better use of limited space. Once you've got it all planted, uh, you just go ahead and just give it a little disturbance on the top here. Just let some of the stuff drop on top. All right. So this is just so you understand the magnitude. The black flies out tonight. <laughs> Just so you can breathe without choking on the flies. Have to have a mask on your face, I tell you. All right, so here we go. So, planted my corn in a, in a triangular pattern. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, like that in triangles. And then uh, with beans in, interspersed. And then I put a sprinkled on top some uh, um, repellent for uh, slugs, because slugs are, are awful here. There we go, it's already on the move. All right. Tell all your friends, here's some more. Yeah, tell all your friends, come on out. So here's something I wanted to talk about is setting up your trellises. At the same time as you're planting your seeds, you should have a good solid trellis. So see what I got here is I've got uh, electrical conduit and they're just uh, attached together with zip ties on top and taped together as uh, two here. And then just uh, a v uh, V's and they're stuck in the ground for about a foot, but uh, attached like that. And then you have to have a cross piece like that. To prevent it from swaying back and forth and uh with a good cross piece you know it's pretty solid it's pretty firm and uh you know it uh you want something that's going to hold in the middle of storm winds you get squalls and freak rainstorms and crazy winds sometimes in summertime so you don't want the whole thing to fall over because that'll rip out all the roots of all your plants and you'll have no harvest. So plan ahead. Um, set it up immediately because if you wait till the plants are starting to are already grown and you start moving around with all of these big sticks and all of these trying to poke holes in the ground and cutting roots, damaging roots. Remember, you're better off having all your stakes in the ground before the roots start to form. So that you don't set back your own plants while you're setting up the trellis. Do it ahead of time. This is for Scarlet Runner beans. So the beans are growing at the base here. And I'm bringing down a string. I ran a string, a doubled up string all the way up to the top. And it ties to that spine that goes all the way across. That metal spine is just basically its old tent poles. And... Uh, so the string is, is tied there with a clove hitch and it's uh, just a little bit of string there. So that top string is not going to hold all that much weight, but it's going to give that extra extension for the Scarlet Runner beans. It's coming down to the ground and I've got another string that comes across our horizontal heat here. So the base is attached to that so it doesn't flap around too far. And then from there, the strings are looped down close to the, uh, close to the beans. And we're going to train the beans up these strings and some of the posts. You can set up a whole trellis system just based on sticks, string, and uh, duct tape. <laughs> so.
So this is how my uh, watering works in these terraced gardens. So I just come in, drop a hose there, turn it on and leave. It floods. Like right here, it's all flooded. So the water, as you can see, is seeping up into the garden beds and it's seeping into the the ground so that uh, the water will actually absorb into this entire uh, garden bed and uh, so because I have heavy clay soil so uh, clay is hard to uh, garden in well actually this is a feature of clay soil that makes gardening a little easier so by making level ditches into the subsoil I take all my topsoil and I take I mound up my topsoil it retains water you know that's great that'll hold water during drought so the very surface of my garden beds the surface soil can stay dry but underneath that it's really really moist there's lots of water and uh, by keeping it topped up like this um, I get uh, I get some really stable uh, water source for my plant so I don't have like tomatoes that crack because they go through a drought um, and then they suddenly get a heavy rain the tomatoes will crack or blossom end rot you know, it's another, another thing that's caused by infrequent or uh, spotty watering these garden beds are above ground level so they drain out well as well that's another thing that uh, clay soil doesn't do so good it doesn't drain out so excess water drains out and goes into the next uh, the next garden bed. So this garden bed is uphill from this one, and then this one's uphill from this one. So when I fill this one, the surface or the extra water will flood into this one. If I forget this on all day, it'll just flood into this garden and then this garden and then that one. Um, I have spring water that supplies my household, so I always have a water flowing. Now, if you're in a situation where you have to res uh, preserve your water, you can get the same convenience of just turning the hose on and then and walking away by having weeper hoses or drip lines. Um, and then you just connect your drip line and snake it around at the base of your, your plants and uh, just turn the water on, let it drip, feed all your plants for an hour or half hour and, and you're done. Now in early spring, in order to get my seeds up, I do hose the, the surface of the gardens. Um, but once the plants are well established, we got uh, some good rooting going on. Like here, we're not quite there yet, but they're starting, the beans are starting to have their second set of flowers or second set of leaves. Uh, and the corn is actually doing pretty good. So these are just about ready to, to just be watered through the walking path. So now that we're full uh, in full summer and uh, the plants are not are developed enough that they can defend themselves from the slugs, um, I can come in and start laying down some mulches. Here I'm putting down some leaves, and in and amongst the uh, the tomato plants here, I put down some uh, some seaweed, uh, specifically eelgrass that uh, washed up on shore. So uh, I grabbed a few bagfuls and uh, I'm laying some out. And then in the walkways, I like to put down some some just some leaves that we collect in the in the fall. Uh, you know, when people leave their bags at the road, well, we pick them up, we bring them here, we lay them down in our walkways, and it helps prevent evaporation and pre prevent uh, soil erosion and uh, adds nutrients to the soil every season. So, uh, as this stuff de decomposes, next spring I'll probably rake that up and put that on top of my garden bed, and I'm continuously adding nutrients to the garden beds like this. So here we have a bed of um, corn and beans growing together. So the beans are shading the ground. So now there's no more weeds going to want to grow underneath there. There's not enough sun. The corn's going to continue to grow up. So the beans are going to grow in the shade of the corn. And uh, we're going to have beans and corn uh, doing a symbiotic relationship. Beans fixing nitrogen in the soil and uh, the corn giving a little bit of shade and a little bit of protection from wind and stuff like that.
Over here we had the same strategy, but failed. So a late frost came in and knocked the beans down. The corn survived, but was knocked back a little bit. So even though these guys uh, germinated earlier in the season, these guys germinated uh, a week later, but after that late frost, and look at how much better it's doing. So it's worth being patient. You don't have to hurry up and get everything in the garden as early as possible. Sometimes it's good to wait and make sure that your crop isn't affected by frost. So here, because it, uh, it got frosted out, the weeds had a chance to grow. Over here, we put up a pretty good canopy and the weeds got uh, are suppressed, but here, so we had to weed here already. Um, it was knocked back, so I added a layer of, uh, of compost on there to try to get, spruce it up a little bit. The leaves got greener again, so the, everything was all pretty yellow here. It was stressed out. It's starting to rain. So uh, we had uh, um, some late frost, and then we had a drought right after that. So we didn't have that much rain most of the late spring. So it was a bit of a challenge, but uh, just flooding, keeping my gardens flooded. Uh, keeps water underground, keeps the soil moist, a good environment for the for germinating my uh, my seeds. So now we got a pretty good canopy going on. Here I got a row of tomatoes. Uh, tomatoes also got affected by the frost, but the, some of them survived, some of them I replaced. I just put down some mulch. Uh, we got some lettuce growing here and there, kind of sprinkled out. I got a row of uh, kohlrabi and carrots in between the kohlrabi and the, and the and the tomatoes over here. I got a mix Salad greens got some uh, lettuce over here got some beets mixed in with some carrots So the beets are going to get harvested early uh, late summer and then the carrots are going to be harvested in, in later fall so as I remove the uh, the beets as they as they get as they get ready to be harvested I'll be clearing more and more space for the carrots and as and that way there'll be a succession of plants growing out of this garden where the carrots are going to uh, mature later in the season than the than beet then I'm able to double up my uh, my crops on the same garden bed so that way it maximizes the productivity of this garden bed so I better get in the house now that it's, uh, the rain is coming down pretty good this is gardening in the Maritimes folks Forget about trying to predict the weather. Mother Nature's got a mind of her own. We're next to an ocean here, folks. Yeehaw! So, hey, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell notification button to make sure that you find out every time we post a new video. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook where we'll be posting all of our notifications, our events and talks and different activities that the group will be organizing.